It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. For this video, I'm gonna respond to PerkerU about the Ten Commandments. Because four months ago, they decided to publish a video talking about the whole entire set. And so for this video, I figure why not respond to them. No document in world history so changed the world for the better, as did the Ten Commandments. I find it so interesting that Mr. Prager has put the Ten Commandments on stone tablets, because in the Bible alone, there are at least three variations of the Ten Commandments. The first variation comes directly from Exodus 20. It says, I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any grieving image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy mother and thy father. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservice, nor his manservants, nor his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. In the book of Deuteronomy, more or less, the second set of Ten Commandments is exactly like the first set. Here is the exact quotation of the third set of the Ten Commandments. The Lord said to Moses, Christ are out two stone tablets like the first one, and I'll write them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning, and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountains. No one's to come with you or to be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and the herds may glaze on the front of the mountain. So Moses crystalled out two stone tablets like the first one and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down unto the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining to love to thousands, and forgetting wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worship. Lord, he said, if I found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stick necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin, and take us as your inheritance. Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation in the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work I am, the Lord will do for you. Obey what I command to you today. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you're going, or they will make a spar among you. Break down their altars, smash their scarce stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. For those who have no idea what are Asherah poles, more or less is a direct reference to Ashura, as in the deity of fertility. This deity is perhaps the wife of El, who is like the head of the Canaanite gods during that time period. And he and Ashura had many, many different kids, including but not limited to Yahweh. Be careful not to make treaty with those who live in the land, for when they prostitute themselves to their gods and sacrifice to them, they will invite you and will eat their sacrifices. And when you choose some of their daughters as wives for your son, and those daughters prostitute themselves to their gods, they will lead your son to do the same. Do not make any idols. Celebrate the festival of unleaved bread. For five days eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Arevi, for in that month you came out of Egypt. The first offspring of every womb belongs to me, including all the firstborn males of your livestock, water from a herd or a flock. Redeem the firstborn donkey with a lamp, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem all your firstborn sons. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall labor, 
but on the seventh day you shall be visited. Even during the plowing season and harvest you must rest. Celebrate the festival of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and the harvest and gathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your men are to appear before the sovereign God, the God of Israel. I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your territory, and no one will convert your land when you go up there three times each year to appear before the Lord your God. Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me, along with anything containing yeast, and do not let any of the sacrifice from the Passover festival remain until morning. Bring the best of the first fruit of your soul to the house of the Lord your God. Do not cook a young goat in his mother's milk. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you in Israel. Moses was there with the God forty days and forty nights without eating bread or drinking water, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. As you guys can see, the third set that I just read out loud are the only set of Ten Commandments that were actually written on stone. And so the ideas of honor your mother and your father, love thy neighbor, honor your God, don't make any sort of graven images, were not written down on stone for the Ten Commandments. Western civilization, the civilization that developed universal human rights, created women's equality, ended slavery, created parliamentary democracy, among other unique achievements, would not have developed without them. As you will see when each of the Ten Commandments is explained, these commandments are as relevant today as when they were given over 3,000 years ago. In fact, they're so relevant that the Ten Commandments are all that is necessary to make a good world, a world free of tyranny and cruelty. There's like so much things that he said that were wrong within seconds, and so I'm gonna try to cover the points point by point. Before the book of Exodus was even written down, there were stone tablets that even predates the Bible when it comes down to basic human rights. The most famous example of this is the Code of Arborashi, which more or less predates the whole entire existence of the Book of Exodus. Although stone tablets like the Code of Arborashi predates the Bible, it's safe to say that the most influential document that exists in the West so far was probably the Magna Carta, which more or less grants people the rights and freedoms and it later influenced things like the United States Constitution. Also, this whole entire argument seems to assume that the Book of Exodus is actually real, that the events are literally real. However, there is like no such evidence that the Exodus even existed. The archeological discoveries roughly collided with the timing of the Israelites' biblical fight from Egypt and the 40 years of wandering the desert and search of the Promised Land. Willie is a myth, Dr. Harris said of the story of the Exodus as he stood at the foot of a wall built during what is called the New Kingdom. Egypt is one of the world's primary warehouses of ancient history. People here joke that whenever you stick a soil in the ground, you'll find artifacts. When workers built a sewer system in downtown Cairo, neighborhood of Doki, they accidentally scattered Roman pottery, but archaeologists who have worked here have never turned up evidence to support the account in the Bible, and there's only one archaeological find that even suggests the Jews were ever in Egypt. Books have been written on the topic, but the discussion has, for the most part, remained low-key as the imperially-minded have tried not to incite the spiritually-minded. If there's no such evidence of the Exodus, I'm kind of curious, why should we believe that the Ten Commandments it's the moral founding of the whole entire Western civilization if there's like no such evidence to support it. When it comes down to sexism, the Bible had very misogynistic views against women. And matter of fact, Paul, the main person that spread the religion, had very, very terrible views when it came down to the treatment of women. Women should remain silent in churches. They are not allowed to speak, but to remain in submission, as the law says. If they want to acquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. 
A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness, or prosperity. Women's rights develop in spite of the Bible. When it comes down to slavery, there's so many verses, both in the Old and the New Testament, that seem to just openly endorse it. So the people scatter all over Egypt to gather scrap for use of straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, Complete the work required of you for each day, just as you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelites' overseers that you have appointed, demanding, why have you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? By the way, I want to further clarify that these are not passages for Christians to follow, but rather part of a story as part of the Exodus. It says, If you buy a Hebrew servant, he is to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he is to go free alone, but he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him. If his master give him a wife, and she bear him sons or daughters, the woman and her children shall belong to her master, and only the man shall go free. But the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children, and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door, or the door post, and pierce his ear with an owl. Then he will be his servant for life. If a man sell his daughter as a servant, she is not to go free as the male servants do. If she does not please the master who has selected her for herself, he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he has broken faith with her. If he selects her for her son, he must grant her the rights of a daughter. If he marries another woman, he must not deprive the first of her food, her clothing, and her marital rights. If he does not provide her with these things, she is to go free, without any payment of money. Just like with Paul's disgusting views on women, he also does not condemn slavery at all. He says that slaves obey your earthly master with respect and fear and with a sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Finally, modern day democracy as we know it today comes directly from ancient Greek. Imagine for a moment a world in which there was no murder or theft. In such a world, there would be no need for armies, or police, or weapons. Oh yes, the Ten Commandments is just so perfect that it forgot about slavery, it forgot about women's rights, it forgot about democracy. But sure, without the Ten Commandments, you know, we're all just doomed to hell. Men and women and children could walk anywhere, at any time of day or night, without any fear of being killed or robbed. You don't really have to imagine that, because most Western countries, that's not the United States, have low rates of robbery and crime in comparison to us. Imagine further a world in which no one coveted what belonged to their neighbor. I find this point to be very curious from Prager University, mostly because they have videos that are literally in support of capitalism. Capitalism versus socialism. Capitalism wins. Is capitalism moral? Video Mariston, why capitalism beats socialism every time. Why socialism never works a video Mariston. A world in which children honor their mother and father and the family unit thrived. Here's a very quick question for everybody watching this video, especially the Christians. Do you guys honestly think that a child should be put to death from their parents if they were to badmouth them? If you guys say no, congratulations. Every single last one of you guys have a conscience. Now, usually when we talk about Jesus, we talk about the Sermon on the Mountain, we talk about the crucifixion, we talk about the miracles. However, it seems as though that he's very much in favor of kids dying from their parents if they were to badmouth them. For God said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses their mother or father is to be put to death. I don't care what kind of social background you guys come from, if you're like poor or rich or middle class. I think 
everybody watching the video, including the Christians, can all agree that in no circumstance it's justified to kill a kid if they were to badmouth their parents. In a modern day setting, most people, what they do is lock the kids to their room or, you know, punish them by not giving them TV or video games, stuff like that. There are many ways to, you know, teach a kid a lesson without having to kill somebody over it. A world in which people obey the injunction not to lie. The recipe for a good world is all there in these 10 sublime commandments. But there is a catch. The Ten Commandments are predicated on the belief that they were given by an authority higher than any man, any king, or any government. That's why the sentence preceding the Ten Commandments asserts the following. God spoke all these words. You see, if the Ten Commandments, as great as they are, were given by any human authority, then any person could say, who is this man Moses? Who is this king or queen? Who is this government to tell me how I should behave? Who is this God? Like I said earlier, the God of the Bible had many chances to create different sets of Ten Commandments, and not a single one of them actually are in favor of women's rights to abolish slavery or to have democracies. And so, my main question is this, if the Bible is the inherent word of God, is supposed to be perfect, how come it never condemned slavery? How come it never advocated for women's rights? How come it never advocated for democracy? There are various verses throughout the New Testament that talks about the concept of hell, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars are all to be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Now, I don't claim to know with 100% certainty if there's an afterlife or not. However, this whole entire idea seems like emotional blackmail to me. That somehow, if you don't believe the exact sort of belief that I do, you deserve to suffer for all eternity. That is really sick. It's very sick and it's very disgusting. Now, when it comes down to prisons, right, there are like various levels of crime that are worse to, you know, lower, right? For example, if somebody was caught smoking like marijuana, obviously that person should not be in the same sort of cell as a rapist or a murderer. Similarly, there are people out there, people like me, who have never, ever done a bad thing in his life. And so, usually, at least in the faith I grew up in, which was like Catholicism, people can go into the booth and go to confession and have their sins forgiven if they have done a bad thing. I have never done like a bad thing throughout my whole entire life. And so, how is it fair? How is this God very just and punishing those who have never done a bad thing other than not believing, but then rewards people who have probably have done bad things, went to confession to, you know, get, you know, forgiven, and they still go to heaven. That just makes no sort of sense to me in the slightest. And it's just so strange to me how this whole entire thing is obviously a scare tactic to make people just stay in the religion. Also, more recently, Ireland had a humongous Catholic influence when it came down to free speech. And so, Thanks to stuff like the Ten Commandments, it was actually being used to silence people if they spoke out against the religion or blaspheme against their God. That does not include the fact that many Christian theocracies in Europe did not allow the most basic human rights, and anybody who spoke out against the church or was considered to be a heretic, they killed them at the stake which is why many people, because of the persecution that was going on in European countries, fled to places like the United States for more religious freedom. And so, this whole entire idea that the Ten Commandments actually changed the world for the better is laughable. 
incredibly laughable to me. Okay, so why is God indispensable to the Ten Commandments? Because, to put it as directly as possible, if it isn't God who declares murder wrong, murder isn't wrong. If the Bible is supposed to be taken literally as the inspired word of God, then obviously just the Old Testament alone, it shows that the God of the Bible is very much pro-genocide, pro-murder, pro-anything that is horrible. By the way, these types of commands that's done by God happen immediately after the Ten Commandments for the first set. Anyone who strikes a person with a fatal blow is to be put to death. However, if it's not done intentionally, but God lets it happen, they are to flee up to a place where it designate. But anyone schemes and kills someone deliberately, that person is to be taken from an altar and be put to death. Anyone who attacks their father or mother is to be put to death. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possessions. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. The Lord saw just how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth, and that every indication of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regret that he made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So, the Lord said, I will wipe on the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I made them. While the God of the Bible tells people not to kill, it seems as though that throughout the whole entire Old Testament, it has no problem doing killing and mass murdering of millions and millions of people throughout the whole entire Old Testament. Now this verse in particular is really disturbing about what Abraham almost did to his son. It says, After these things, God decided to test Abraham's faith. God said to him, Abraham, and he said, Yes. Then God said, Take your son to the land and kill your son there as a sacrifice for me. This must be Isaac, your only son, the one you love. Use him as a burnt offering as one of the mountains there. I will tell you which mountains. That whole entire passage was very disgusting to me when I first read it for the first time. So, if God were to say that murder is, you know, right, I would say, first of all, that's just God's opinion because God constantly just changed his opinion throughout the whole entire Bible. And so, I reject the notion, if he were to say that murder is right, I would completely reject it on the notion that, of course, murder is obviously wrong. And so, I don't think just because something comes from a higher power does not mean that that higher power is therefore just. I would say even if there's like no such thing as a higher power, murder is still wrong because it kills innocent life. Humans throughout history have developed empathy and the whole entire idea of the golden rule is to do unto others as you would do unto you. And so, I don't think even if there was some sort of higher power, that's still a justification to follow the rules because ultimately, you need to actually look into your moral soul inside of yourself to know what is right from wrong. And we as a society have developed rules and a general consensus on what is right, what is wrong, how to treat people, how not to treat people. And so, I don't think necessarily that any person need to have a God in order to be moral. Yes, this strikes many people today as incomprehensible, even absurd. Many of you are thinking, is this guy saying you can't be a good person if you don't believe in God? Let me respond as clearly as possible. I am not saying that. Of course there are good people who don't believe in God, just as there are bad people who do. And many of you are also thinking, I believe murder is wrong, I don't need God to tell me. Now that response is only half true. I have no doubt that if you're an atheist and you say that you believe murder is wrong, you believe murder is wrong. 
but forgive me, you do need God to tell you. We all need God to tell us. You see, even if you figured out murder is wrong on your own, without God and the Ten Commandments, how do you know it's wrong? Not believe it's wrong, I mean know it's wrong. The fact is, you can't. Because without God, right and wrong are just personal beliefs, personal opinions. I think shoplifting is okay, you don't. Unless there is a God, all morality is just opinion and belief. If God does not exist, why do all people have a fixed moral obligation to love and not murder? How do molecules in motion have any authority to tell you how to behave? When you do something wrong, whose standard are you breaking? Who are you displeasing? The carbon atom, the benzene molecule, who? This question has been asked, uh, the, Socrates answered it like this, when he was on trial for his life. Uh, accused of blasphemy, by the way. Um, he said that he had an inner daemon, was the way he put it. Not demon, a daemon, a spirit, uh, an inner critic, a conscience would be one way of putting it. And that he, he knew enough to know, even when he was making the best speech of his life, that if he was making a point that was somehow dishonest or uh, incomplete or shady, the daemon would tell him, yeah, that was clever, but you shouldn't have tried it. He knew. Any, any person of average moral equipment has the same knowledge. I, I hope you'll... If you don't, I'm very sorry for you. Um, Adam Smith uh, called it the, the internal witness, who we all have to have a conversation with all the time. Um, it's been... C.S. Lewis decided to call it conscience and to attribute it to the, to the divine, but he didn't improve on what Adam Smith said in Theory of Moral Sentiments or what Socrates said when, on, when standing trial for his own for his own life. It's been sometimes colloquially defined as why do people behave well when nobody's looking? I don't believe there's anyone in this hall who doesn't know what I mean by that. Why, when it won't do you any good, will you decide, I could have kept that wallet I found on the back of the cab seat, but I'm not going to. I'm going to turn it in. I'm going to see if, find, the, find its real possessor. There are people to whom that, those thoughts do not occur, who are deaf to that idea, who only think of themselves, who wouldn't worry about the internal daemon or censor or, uh, or companion. And there are, of course, people who only get pleasure from being um, unpleasant to other people and inflicting cruelty on them. The first group we call the sociopathic and the second group we call the psychopathic. My only, and they occur in nature and in society. My only problem is with those who think that they're all made in the image of God the one explanation that absolutely doesn't work at all, that gets you nowhere, that explains nothing. We do not get it from Big Brother. If we did, that would degrade it. It would mean it wasn't heroic. It wasn't brave. It wasn't individual. It wasn't exemplary. Why are these it things didn't deserve good? anything. What are... it would, because it would be in the hope either of a reward from Big Brother or for fear of punishment from it. It would abolish morality. Why... It destroys ethics. And virtually every atheist philosopher has acknowledged this. Citation needed. Please tell me which atheist philosopher actually states that you need God to be moral. I'm still kind of waiting for that sort of, you know, citation from you because I cannot find any sort of citations in the video link at all or in the comment section. Another problem with the view that you don't need God to believe that murder is wrong is a lot of people haven't shared your view. And you don't have to go back very far in history to prove this. In the 20th century, millions of people in communist societies and under Nazism killed about 100 million people. And that doesn't count a single soldier killed in war. So don't get too confident about people's ability to figure out right from wrong without a higher authority. It's all too easy to be swayed by a government or a demagogue or an ideology or to rationalize that the wrong you're doing isn't really wrong. And even if you do figure out what is right and wrong, God is still necessary. People who know the difference between right and wrong do the wrong thing all the time. You know why? Because they can. They can because they think no one is watching. But if you recognize that God is the source of moral law, you believe that he is always watching. 
I just love how he construes that anything that is not Judeo-Christian values must be Nazism or Communism. However, things are not entirely just black and white. For example, with the case of, of course, Communism, I will acknowledge that what happened during like this whole entire time of Stalin is very terrible. However, I don't think that the whole entire case of Stalin is, you know, a secular thing because the very definition of secularism is to have a separation of church and state or belief or disbelief. And so because Stalin used state atheism by the very definition, that cannot, of course, be like, you know, a secular example. Now, as far as Hitler is concerned, I would say, yes, what happened in the Holocaust, what happened in Nazi Germany is also really terrible. However, when it comes down to the belief system of Adolf Hitler, more or less, what happened is that he used elements of Christianity, elements of occultism, and combined the ideologies together to, you know, use it for his Nazi regime, right? Not to mention the many Nazi soldiers that says God with us under belt buckle. And so the ideology of the Nazis is like a combination of Christianity as well as occultism, not to mention the fact that with the whole entire case with the Catholic Church, they actually worked with the Nazi regime to actually, you know, oppress the people. And the same thing with the Muslims because Hitler also worked with the Muslims to do whatever kind of evil deeds that he wanted to during his time of power. Now, as far as this whole entire notion that without God, you would not actually not murder or do anything wrong, I'm sorry, that is not true in the slightest. Because let's look at the data when it comes down to the prisoners in the United States for those who are believers and non-believers. Now, when it comes down to the prison population, the highest one is, of course, the Protestants at 50.6%. The Catholics are 14.5%. No religious preference is 10.6% of the prison population. Muslim is 9.4%. Unknown is 5%. Native American spirituality is 2.7%. Jewish is 1.7%. Pagan is 1.7%. Other non-Christian religions are 1.5%. Buddhists are 0.9% and Mormons are at 0.8%. So even if somebody was religious and believed that the morality comes from God, that still does not, of course, let people off the hook because there are still people that still kill other people no matter if they believe in God or not. And so not just that though, but it turns out that the more the secular a country is, the less that there's actually crime in general and that the overall happiness of people in those secular countries is actually higher in comparison to the religious ones. As a matter of fact, I read that the countries that are the most religious happen to, you know, have the highest rates of crime in comparison to the non-religious countries. And so, even if somebody followed God's rule, they will kill no matter what, and of course, if they don't follow God's rule, they'll still end up being okay as examples in those kind of non-Christian countries. So even if you're an atheist, you would want people to live by the moral laws of the Ten Commandments. And even an atheist has to admit that the more people who believe God gave them, and therefore they are not just opinion, the better the world would be. Like I said earlier, the Ten Commandments does not stop people from killing. It does not condemn slavery. It does not advocate for women's rights. It does not advocate for free speech. And as evident by Ireland and very heavily Catholic, you know, places, it actually limits people's rights. And also during the whole entire medieval period of the Dark Ages, people were actually persecuted because they used stuff like the Ten Commandments. So no, even if people use the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments are not perfect because, again, it does not condemn slavery, it does not advocate for women's rights, it does not advocate for human rights. 
And so, sorry, I think the world would be actually be a better place without the Ten Commandments. But anyway, what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video.